Hello Stuart, and uh, thanks ever so much for uh, taking part in this little uh, bit of an interview with these questions that come from the OMD group um, on Facebook. So we've got a few questions to fire through, and uh, let's see how we go with them. So coming from Jinska Jonka Jansen, she's got a couple of questions for you. It says, on Facebook, Stuart, it looks like you've got a nice warm family. What's it like for them now you're playing in a famous band and going on tour? And do they miss you when you're out? And also, is being a member of OMD now a little bit different to being a member of OMD then? Well, first off, uh, yeah, family are fantastic and very supportive. And uh, I've had uh, last summer when we were doing the, the festivals, they uh, waved me off and welcomed me back and enjoyed the fact that their, well, their dad and their partner particularly was you know, on TV or in the, uh, on the Facebook. So it was really interesting for me uh, to find how much support I had from them. It was great. Um, I can't remember the second question. Yeah, the second one is, um, being a member of OMD now, is it different to being an OMD, a member of OMD back then? Yeah, the, um, back in the 90s, there was a lot more pressure. Um, I think OMD were, because they were in the charts a lot more, there was a lot, a lot more high profile than they are now. Um, but uh, it was extreme pressure to perform you know, really, really well, whereas now, uh, we're a little bit older, you don't feel that pressure the same way. Yeah. We're a bit more experienced. Older and wiser? Possibly, I've talked about the wiser, but <laughs> certainly older. Okay, coming from Connor Blanford. Um, if you could change one thing about the days you were in OMD, what would they be? I'd say um, that they never ended because uh, it was such a great time for me and um, when we stopped doing that, and uh, it's basically because I think Radio 1 changed the way they did um, the, the playlisting so that anyone that was over 25 years old as people didn't get on the playlist so that completely changed the way that, uh, that you know, things were released so you know, it was a very difficult time but you know, it's a shame it, it happened but then without that we wouldn't have the other things that we've done since. So. Uh, it was the days of banning, uh, banning Blondie, wasn't it? Maria went to number one. That's so, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Coming from Francis Sinclair, um, prior to the reunion, did you ever believe there was still a mass market for OMD? Behind the scenes, what, what is it you think makes OMD tick as a group? Um, I think what makes OMD tick is uh, probably Andy's drive and Paul's drive. I think they... Um, Together, they you know they are the, the engine room of the, of the band, and um, Andy has crazy ideas. Paul filters them. It's perfect balance. I think. Uh, I can't remember the first part of the question again. Yeah, no, it was just sort of asking. Um, did you ever believe there was, was still a market for OMD? Uh, oh. uh, you know, with the, with the following and the record sales and. Definitely, there was always a market for OMD. I think, um, you know, even though Radio 1 didn't support and, and the BBC didn't support them um, in this country, that certainly around the world and, and, and definitely in this country, there's always been a loyal fan base and anything is, is, is well received. And we're very lucky as a band to have that. Yeah. I think the following is, is just quite remarkable, you know, that you, know, that, that you manage to maintain. Yeah, they're, they're um, incredible. Coming from Angela Brown, um, if you weren't in OMD, which band would you like to be a member of? Uh, I don't think I'd want to be in a, any band that would have me as a member, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, I suppose, you know, Foo Fighters, you know, who wouldn't want to be in the Foo Fighters? I, I, I've got to say, yeah, probably yeah. that. Okay, I've got a few questions coming from Hagen, um, who's well, obviously well known within the OMD fan circle, he's got his own website. And um, coming in from Facebook, He's asking, alongside with Andy, that you were jointly responsible for Atomic Kitten, song, uh, songwriting and producing. Are you proud of what you achieved with Atomic Kitten? Yeah, I'm always uh, proud of what I do, unless it's you know appalling. But I don't think anything I, I actually release is ever appalling. Um, so uh, for me, it's, it's really, music's so subjective. Uh, that from time to time in a career people will like and dislike things that you do, that's their choice, you know, ultimately it's up to them, but yeah, I've always been proud of what I've done. Brilliant. And so obviously since the demise, if you like, of Atomic Kitten and everything that went on and coming back to OMD, what have you been up to? Um, I've, well, I had uh, spent a lot of time with my kids. Uh, the youngest son's got autism, uh, or it has, a, has an autistic spectrum disorder, and so I spent a lot of time with him uh, in his early years. He's now in secondary school, 
so that took up a lot of time. And then I decided that um, I'd do a history degree because I love modern history and it just seemed the right fit. And then right in the middle of that, Andy phoned me up and said, listen, you know, do you want to come and play with us again? And I said, no. All right then. Yeah, Excellent. Um, so from Marcus Djokovic, I think I've got the name right, will you be taking part in any of the new OMD album material? Um, and if you do take part, will you be a drummer? Obviously I can't answer anything about any upcoming uh, recordings or, or, or anything like that, but uh, I'm looking forward to this next process and uh, the new album next year. Good. It's, uh, it's going to be a good one. I know a lot of fans are excited by it. Another question from Hagen. He says, do you like to drum alongside with a click track live on stage? And do you wish there was more space for improvising within the OMD songs that you're playing live? Um, I do actually enjoy playing to a click. Um, it's, it gives you a certain amount of security so that you know that everything's going to be rattling along at the right time. And we have back projections and things to synchronise to, so it's really important. And I know he's a drummer, so I, I know he, he, he would probably, in my position, he would probably want one as well. Um, so that's, that's for him to answer. Second half of the question? Uh, the second one was, would you improvise playing any of the OMD <laughs> songs when uh, you're playing live? Yeah, I, I do try and slip in the odd thing every now and again, but uh, Andy's quite... Um, quite dist I mean, the, the, the parts are parts, And I see myself more now as kind of um, like a... You know, I, I, I look after the, the songs more. So kind of when I was younger, I was far more interested in making a lot of fills and stuff like that, but now... I kind of I like to feel the song a lot more and a, you know more of a curator than a creator on the on the last stuff. Thank you for that one. Um, a question from Helga Sandmeister. Are you going to be playing um, in May at the concerts that are taking place in Germany? Yes, uh, I shall be drumming um, at the back uh, for for the Dazzle Ships and the Architecture and Morality gigs, the special gigs that we're doing in Germany. And the album oh, it's be great. I look forward to it. It's soon be upon us as well, isn't it? Yeah. Can seem weeks away. From Mark Rogers, um, he says, Do you think all the songs you wrote with Andy for Atomic Kitten could have worked as an actual standalone OMD album? Um, I don't know about the whole album, uh, you know, the, all the songs we did, but the, the vast majority of them were definitely of the same feelings. When we were writing them, they were the same way that we, we wrote them with Sugar Tax and Liberator and stuff. It was the same, same you know chemistry between me and Andy and I certainly think some of the songs would work as, as R&D songs now. Yeah, it's interesting uh, hearing Andy sing Paul again uh, yeah. and you can recognise it as really an R&D song. Very much, I, I, I mean particularly I think on the first oh, uh, Atomic Kitten album there's a song called Strangers which I think is really very R&D for us, you know, it's how we wrote it and it just happened to get the girls to sing it. I think. <laughs> Good way to go about. Um, a question from Jane Rachel um, it says, "What bands influenced you when you started your musical career, and which bands do you like to listen to?" And she's she's suspecting it's not going to be Kraftwerk. <laughs> um, I certainly listen to more Kraftwerk now than I did then. Um, I've got I'm more into electronic music now, electro particularly than than, uh, than than I was when I was younger. But I was sort of prolific um, amount of music that I listened to that influenced uh, me. I'm from Rock, soul, funk, jazz, you know, um, electro, everything was, it was a really exciting time in the late 70s, early 80s for music, punk, even, you know, and that whole attitude, the way people do music, uh, then was far more exciting than, say, now, I think, I think a lot of the stuff in the charts, it, it was a lot more eclectic then, now it's, it's very, uh, very much the same sort of McDonald's kind of music, as we call it. No, thanks uh, for that, Stu. Uh, question from Neil uh, McClinnam. He says, when you have drum problems, like twice at uh, Park Pot, how much of a panic does that cause? Mm. Uh, yeah, we, he's referred, of course, we played Park Pop in, uh, in, in, in Holland, and uh, yeah, it was a nightmare. I had the hi-hat um, completely broke, and my snare drum broke all in one song, and it took two songs to sort it out. And yes, it was probably the most horrific thing I've been through in my life in front of I don't know how many thousands of people who were there and it was just I was like that ah scary 
horrible. Don't want that to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a new, a new hi hat pedal, which, uh, which seems to be working properly now. So brilliant. Uh, one from Catherine Hooper. He says, um, "What made you start playing the drums, and when did you get your first drum kit?" Also, do you have a preferred or a lucky type of drumsticks? Right, well, uh, I was about five years old. I walked past a music shop with my parents and I went, I want to play the drums. And they said, right, I'm getting piano lessons. So I got my piano lessons and then when I was 11, I'd been banging on every year and finally got me uh, a, a place in a brass band, you know, playing brass band music. And they bought me a very small, uh, cheap kit that I loved and played on until I got my first professional kit. So. Yeah, it was a, a very young start, but I used to play with rulers on tubs, um, you know, for years. Just like I'd have like ice cream tubs, empty ice cream tubs, and play them in my bedroom all, all the time. So by the time I got a kit, I kind of had the idea, but it was a completely different thing to use all four limbs. Yeah, but yeah, I loved it. Um, last and then the other bit, part of it, so have you got any uh, particularly lucky type of drumsticks or oh, preferred? Oh, of course, I love. Vic Firth, they're amazing. The the hickory sticks are just giving the right amount of bounce and uh, the right weight, and they're fantastic. They're uh, very reliable sticks. They don't break as much as the other sticks that have used. So yeah. Okay, and coming from Catherine again. Um, has having your own family changed your perception in life? And what's it like for them when you're playing um, in the band and touring? Yeah, obviously priorities change. And when I was younger, it was all about me. Um, when you have a family, everything changes. Yeah, your whole priority, the outlook on life. And um, I feel, you know, very precious time when your kids are young as well to, to spend with them. And now to be going away a little bit more, well, quite a lot more than I was uh, before, is, is going to be hard. You know, it's not going to be easy. But um, they're supportive, and um, I think it's, it's they know that it's the thing that I'm probably best at doing so I'm probably best at doing that. Brilliant and another one from Catherine it says what are the best and the worst bits about touring? <laughs> uh, the best bits are when you're on stage playing and it's all going really well and the crowd are buzzing and the music's like exciting and you feel you're just locked into it, it that's great and the worst bit's probably when your hi-hat stops working the snare drum falls off and you break a stick and like everything goes wrong or you can't hear anything. Oh yeah, that, that, that's bad. And also, of course, being away from the family is probably the worst bit. And from Ali Fielder, um, tell us a bit about your time with Andy in the old days. Have you got any little gems about it that, that you sort of remember, you know, with Andy and the other band members? Um, I think, to be honest, uh, it was a it was a really long time. Was it 21, 22 years ago? I think um, we did do one tour where uh, it was probably the, the, we went on a safari in the middle of the tour, and it was just the strangest thing to be on tour, safari tour. So we were out with all these lions and Andy and uh, Nigel. Um, we, we were driving out in this thing. We all got these massive red, mar like red foreheads, being out in the day. Um, but <laughs> Nigel just got chased by a rhino for some reason. At this point, we were all we all had these great big red faces. And as he was running towards us, when we just went ah, because we had these red. Faces. No, anyway. But yeah, we played footy. It was great. Uh, every time in sound check, um, we'd be kicking a football about. It was a good time, you know. It was really good times. Um, also coming from Ali, she's asking, um, what's it feel like now to be in the band, now you're sort of back with the original lineup, to take away Mally, but you know, obviously you've got Paul and Martin in there, what's that feel like? Um, yeah, it's great, I mean initially when we first started rehearsing together, I know um, the guys would look up from the keyboards and double take, because it, you know, well, obviously it wasn't Mal, and they were so used to playing and looking up and seeing Mal. Um, for me it was weird the other way around, instead of it being Nigel and, and Phil, it was to complete the other guys and I'd look up and go, whoa! Uh, so yeah, but after the after a couple of days it, it you know, settled in and it just feels really natural now. We've, we've got really good chemistry that, that, that works, you know, very tight. So I'm enjoying it, it's great. Brilliant. And we're actually on to the last question, um, and again it's from Ali. She's asking, um, were you actually a fan of OMD before, uh, before getting involved with them? And what's your personal music preference in the early days? 
Um, I yeah, that, I think we've covered this a little bit, but yeah, I I wasn't like what you call an OMD fan. That's for sure. Um, I met Andy. He came to produce something for a band I was in, and I started working with him. And it was only then that I started to see what the band had done. I mean, I heard hits, and I, when I saw them live um, on the Sugar Tax tour, it was the first time I sat. I went, Oh, they did this one. Oh, they did this. One. Did they do this song? And it, that happened. Like, and I, it was because um, I was so busy. I didn't really, at the time, listen to lots of. Uh, uh, of stuff of, of OMDs, but now it's all in here, it's all in here, it's like part of me now. So it's a you know, very different contrast between when I was younger and now. And the last bit of the question again, it's not really... Yeah, she says, he uh, was asking, asking about your musical preference in the early days. Um, uh, well, yeah, I, I liked rock, I liked um, uh, soul and funk, uh, rap. I was in a rap band, uh, Raw and Limited, we, uh, we did we did rap, um, you know, that's what we did, and it was all very streety and, and wonderful, but um, I don't know, I, I don't really, I wasn't really into it in, when I was younger, um, thought it was, you know, it wasn't my, my bag really, but as I've got older, it's, it's amazing, but especially when you see it in perspective of uh, the passage of time and the, the music in its position, particularly Dazzle Ships, it was amazing to see it was a Cold War album. And you know, it really reflects now. At the time, it didn't seem to, but now it reflects those times perfectly. So I wish it paid more attention. And just as a bit of a supplementary on that one, it's actually coming from myself. This one, um, obviously, we had Abe Dukes mm. on drums as the um, the new lineup. Yeah. Did Did you mention that, did, that you actually did you actually see him play live? Yeah, I saw him. I, I saw Abe a couple of times um, on the Sugar Tax tour. He was great. He's a great drummer. Um, very, you know, very vibrant, and he, he does. He did feel. I've heard a few things where he's because I've been doing my research, and he's uh, he used to do a lot more fills than Andy lets me do. So, you know, good on him. Well done. Brilliant, <laughs> Stu. I'd just like to say thanks for everybody from the um, OMD Facebook uh, group that we've got going, and uh, thanks for your time this afternoon. No Thank worries. you.